Praise God, praise God. We're going to pick up where we left off last week and the 38th chapter, beginning with the first verse. We dealt with that, but to bring us up to speed, go ahead and read verses 1, 2, and 3, please. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against God, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog is another name for the Antichrist. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. For many years, Bible teachers have thought that these passages refer to Russia, but a closer investigation of the statements prove otherwise. Therefore, the phrase, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, is not referring to Russia, but, but instead to the Antichrist. Let's start right there for a moment, please. We had a tour of the Soviet Union, then called the Soviet Union. I think it was 1987, I believe. And uh, um, we were assigned a KGB agent to interpret for us. And his story is another miracle. But I preached in Moscow one particular night, <clears throat> and we rode a train all night long to Minsk, another major city in the then the Soviet Union. When, when we arrived and I stepped off the train, there was a battery of investigators and, and um, uh, journalists, television people, and they surrounded me. And uh, one of them stated to start off the conversation, he stated, you people, you preach against us. You say we are an evil empire. And President Reagan had just made that statement. <laughs> a short day, a few days before, that this is an evil empire. And they said, what do you say? And um, I don't like to get on the bad side of people in Soviet Union. <laughs> I told him, I said, sir, I'm not here to involve myself in your politics. I'm here for one purpose, and that's to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, they, they accepted it. And our first service was in a Pentecostal church. It was quite a large church, and it was packed to the gunwale, so to speak. And um, the Spirit of God moved in the message a powerful way. And I, I made a statement. I said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go to every town and village and city in the Soviet Union. Now, was, the Soviet Union was made up of 15 republics, including, I don't know, 15 or 20 countries. And when I said it, I, I thought, Lord, what did I say? And I turned around because the interpreter did not interpret it. And he was standing a little bit behind me, and tears were rolling down his face. And uh, he gave his heart to the Lord right standing right there. And I went ahead and, and preached the same message again, that in every home and village, now this in, in the Soviet Union, the gospel is going to be preached. And when the service was over, I told Francis, I said, did you hear that? And am I sure that's the Lord that said that? Because you're talking about astronomically impossible in the natural, but with God, all things are possible. She said, oh, yes, I, I heard it. And uh, 
My interpreter went ahead and interpreted it for me at that last second time. It must have been about four or five months later, Jim Woolsey came into my office and said, Brother Swagger, I think we can get on television on TV One. That was the propaganda channel. It went into every home in the Soviet Union, all 15 republics, every home. He said, I think we can get on television there. I said, Jim, are you out of your mind? <laughs> this is the largest atheistic country in the world, much less 15 republics with them. He said, I know it, but I believe we can do it. And I'll have to give Jim the credit for that because it wasn't my faith. And about two months later, we started sending tapes, and they started playing them. We went into every home. We got so many letters that it filled up a room in a house that we rented. I mean, literally filled up the room. I don't mean on scattered on the floor. I meant to the ceiling with letters because they'd never heard the gospel. I remember they would bring back here handfuls of letters and just at random, just pick them up at random. And I don't, I don't think I was the one who read it. Somebody else did. One brother wrote, he said, Brother Swaggart, I was a drunk. He said, I... Every morning I got up, I drank a fifth of vodka. Now you think of that. And he said, that morning I turned on the TV set, never dreaming what I would see, because we had never seen any gospel in the Soviet Union. And he said, your program was coming on, and I thought, what in the world is this? But he said, when it was ended, my alcohol days were over. Jesus Christ had come into my heart and to my life, changed me. And I remember the, 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 the translator that we had, like I said, he was a KGB agent. He gave his heart to Christ there at Minsk. And when we were leaving Moscow, a couple of three, four days later, ever how long it was. He said, when y'all came, I, didn't know, I did not know who he was. But now I do. I know who he is. The Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. You know, last Sunday night, we had a pastor and his wife here in the service from the Ukraine. Yeah. You, you met them. And I preached for him in the Ukraine a few years ago. And to hear the testimonies of all of those pastors, there was probably about a thousand uh, people, majority of them pastors, and uh, telling me of what the telecast meant to them in the 80s. One particular brother had been in prison in one of the gulags there for several years because of his faith. And he was uh, brutalized, beat, just everything in his course of time there. And he said that uh, when he got out, he didn't know if he was going to make it or not. He was so beaten down physically when he finally was released. But he said when he got home, that telecast, he started watching his family, told him, you've got to watch this, you've got to watch this. And he said the, the, the strength that came from the program is the strength that raised him up. But testimony after testimony, uh, I had one tell me, it, you know, everything we know about Pentecost, we learned from the telecast. Or I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit watching the telecast. Or our family got saved. I mean, the testimonies all over. It was just tremendous of what the Lord did. Every city we went into, we had to first of all go to the Commissar of Religion. And the one in Moscow was... He spoke impeccable English, 
tremendously educated. He was a young man, 30-odd years old, I guess. And um, it was a pleasure to talk to him. But in Novosibirsk, um, <laughs> it was altogether different. I walked into the room. Jim was with me. And uh, our translator was with us as well. And there's several men in this room, and uh, one of them walked up to me, and I held out my hand to shake hands with him, and he ignored it. He didn't shake hands. His first words were, you preach against us. Mm. I thought, Lord, what do we got into here now? You preach against us. And he was right. I did. And... Um, he said, we're not going to put up with that. And I thought, Lord, whispering under my breath, show me what to do here. And um, he had a whole bevy of medals. The, the, they liked it. They, they wore their medals on their tunic. And uh, coming from what they called the Patriotic War, they lost some 20 million people in that carnage. Anyway, I asked him, I said, what's that, that big medal for, trying to change the subject? And he said, I was in the Battle of Kursk. I, I had just read a book on the Battle of Kursk. I said, you mean to say you were in that battle? Tell me about it. He said, you really want to know? I said, certainly I do. And for, I don't know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, he regaled me with how they had defeated the Germans and had, had knocked out the German Tiger tank that was the biggest in the world. And uh, whenever he, f he finished, put his arms around me and... Uh, shook hands and said, Preacher, if you need anything while you're here, just let me know. <laughs> and he was that kind. I prayed with him and whatever the case may be. But there was a hunger in that country for the gospel. And God opened the door and did exactly what that word, word of prophecy was given that Sunday morning that the gospel will go to every town, village, and city in the Soviet Union. And it did exactly that. We were there for how many years, Donnie, you remember? Two years. Two or three years. You know, speaking of, all this was going on whenever I was a child. I was about maybe 9, 10, 11 years old. But about 15 years ago, when I was at the airport here in Baton Rouge, I was checking in to go to a meeting from somewhere or for somewhere and I was standing in line and, and right next to me there was two men older than I was. They were probably in their 40s. I was probably in my early 30s at that time and uh, he just stared at me and there was a long line of people. It was just a busy day and he just kept staring at me and looking. And you know, when somebody's staring at you, you don't really know what to do. You don't know whether to duck or pucker. You know, you just kind of, you know, I finally just looked at him. I said, how you doing? And he said, you're one of them, aren't you? And I said, I have no idea. What, what are you referring to? He said, you're a swagger, aren't you? And of course, when he said that, everybody turned. Everybody was looking right at me. And I said, yes, sir. And he broke. And just tears began to run down his face. And he said, I grew up in the Soviet Union. My mm. parents mm. lived in the Soviet Union. I'm here in the States now. I live in the States. He said, but if it were not for the telecast and your grandfather, my parents would have died lost. But my parents were saved before they passed away. I'm saved. My family is saved. My, my, my wife is saved. My children, we all go to an Assembly of God church here in the States, all because my parents turned on the telecast and they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I, I sat there for a moment and I was just kind of, 
enjoying his conversation, but at the same time, I'm, in my heart, I'm thinking, we don't really know the impact that that telecast had, not just in Russia, but all over the world. How many people's lives were changed because they heard you preaching the gospel or heard you at a, wherever it may have been. Lives have been changed as a result of this yes, gospel. Yes, yes. And I don't want any one of us to take that for granted of what we're doing here. We're doing the most important work there is, telling people about Jesus. That's it. That's the greatest wonder, work in the world. We wonder what's, you know, all that's going on in the world. And it, it just seems that things get worse and worse. You're talking about the, the southern border. You're talking about the uh, crime that goes on in the United States, uh, Ukraine, Israel. You, you could just go down the list and, and Christians are wondering, what can I do? It seems like it's, it's overwhelming. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm just an individual Christian. What can I do? Well, one of the things you can do is give to the share to uh, provide. You know, we're talking about the telecast that was on only one hour a week. That's right, yeah. One hour a week, and you see the impact that it had. You know, We're talking about a, a network that's on 24 hours a day. During those days, Dave, um, it cost $100,000 a week to air the, the program. We came to the edge of bankruptcy. We didn't, didn't have the money. And, um, but God made a way. Yes. He made a way. There were times I went to bed at night not knowing if we would be on the next week. Didn't know where the money would come from, but it always did yes. by the grace of God. And uh, I thank God for the people who stood with us. And are standing with us today. And are standing with us today. Thank you for saying that. Yes, exactly. And uh, because they believe as well that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most, it's the greatest factor on the face of the earth. But we can get involved in politics and we need to. We need to vote. We need to, who, need to know who we're voting for and where uh, our leaders stand on issues. But that's not going to change. The only thing that's going to change this world is changed hearts. That's it. Yeah. The gospel alone can do that. Nothing yes. else can. Brother Swaggart, you know, to add to what Brother Dave just said, I know I said this a few weeks ago, but it's worth noting because it's right here in our text. Actually, what you referenced when you went to Russia and the man said it himself, he said, you preach against us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a farce. It's a, it's a lie. It's a distortion when, when it's stated the church should not dabble in politics. Um, here we have a man of God who's told by God, set your face against Gog and prophesy against it's pretty him. pretty strong, isn't it? The Lord is asking his prophet, as the church is asked today, to be a restraining force against evil. Right, right. And so enough with this nonsense, and I, you know, forgive me, but don't forgive me, um, that we should not be involved with, quote, politics. Most of the time we're dealing with morality. Yes. And, and when God asks the church to take a stand, he means it. And we should, as, as well as the prophet Ezekiel here in the text, we should prophesy against evil. It is important. It sets things into motion in the spirit world. Right. And uh, right. God asked him to take that stand. It's not fun to have to do it. But we're asked and we are, we're beckoned by the Holy Spirit to do it. And I thank God for, I, Brother William Federer was here just a few months ago or maybe a, a little longer than that. And, and he spoke of the, the, the ingenuity of preachers in the forming of our nation. And if it wasn't for preachers, we wouldn't have this great nation. And, uh, right. and so we, right. we've, we're losing some of that. But uh, thank God we haven't lost it all. And there's still hope for our nation if we'll get preachers to understand what 
just this simple text. I just want to make that observation. Well, Joseph, to bring up a point, just because the media or the world labels something as politics and political doesn't mean that it is. They can say that the sky is green and the grass is blue. They're wrong. The fact is, a lot of things that they say are political are moral, to your point, and they're spiritual. And it is, it is not just the, the right, it's the responsibility of every preacher and really every child of God to address these situations and to address these issues. The reason that we're in this mess right now is because the church has been without a backbone. Because the church has chosen to look to other things for decades. That's why we're in this mess. And so it's time that the church and it's time that preachers quit being sissies and stand up and deal with the issues in a spirit of love. But all of us that are parents understand this. To express love properly, sometimes you have to be harsh and correct. Now, I'm, some of us on here are younger men, so we have to watch our place. But the truth is the truth. And that shouldn't deter anyone from speaking the truth just because of whatever fact or whatever excuse. It's high time that the church stand up instead of cowering back. There, there's a culture today, and we sometimes joke about it, but it's called cancel culture. That if you say something that's deemed offensive, just because they say it's offensive, they're going to cancel you. Well, I would say to the church, and I would say to pastors and to preachers, if God has called you, and he's anointed you, don't worry about that. Because it's the Lord who's raised you up. He's given you the platform, and there's no bunch of whatever you want to say that's going to take it away from you. You preach and speak on the truth. So just to bring up that point, you know, we talk about the Middle East, Israel, everything that's going on. These are things that we need to look to the Word of God for wisdom and direction. If Washington would do that, we would see a whole other direction of things playing out right now in this country. But I'm so tired of hearing about things that are, it's political. No, it's moral and it's spiritual. And it's the responsibility of every Christian to deal with that. And one other little note, you know, I think oftentimes, because we, we get, Dad and I get the emails especially. Shouldn't deal with politics. Okay. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Jesus got a little political. He was asked regarding taxation, right. which was yeah. the most political thing in Israel of that day because Rome was extremely oppressive over Israel, especially when you put in the tax collectors. And, but it, it, that was a very politically charged. They were trying to trap him. And he answered with the wisdom of God. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render unto God the things which are God's. So Jesus dealt and put in order their mindset on what they were focusing as being political he put it right in order for them, and preachers today should do the same thing. Right. If, if um, the United States is basically the one country in the world that can help Israel, there are a few other countries that stand with Israel, but they don't provide any, any resources to, to help the country. This country does. But we know that's because of the hundreds of thousands of born-again believers in this country. And will there come an hour to where that we will not give Israel our support? Well, there's a lot of people in this country right now that would like that to be the case. That's, that's exactly, we're, we're very divided as a nation. At. Yeah, we're very divided as a nation. And unfortunately, if this administration has a second go around, we'll probably see it move more in that direction. But, but let's, let's remember this. We can support Israel in, in multiple facets, but one thing I'll say, the United States doesn't need to spend a dollar to actually lend support to Israel. What we need to do is stand up in front of the world and speak up for Israel and support her through those means, for starters. The aid package and all of these things, Israel, yes, benefits. And, of course, um, their F-35s they use are made by Lockheed Martin, which is an American company. But that's all beside the point. Speaking in, the, in, in this realm, if the United States, and let me be more specific, if the president of the United States of America would stand up to the world, because we fund most of the world, and say, listen, Hamas is a terrorist organization. 
We, the United States, support Israel going in, eliminating the terrorists, getting back all of the hostages, and making sure that those Hamas do not crop back up in that area, which, by the way, gentlemen, that's happening already. There's, I was just looking at a report today from a colonel in the IDF who's saying in the northern part of Gaza, Israel has now shifted her attention to the south. In the north, they've had hundreds of thousands of Palestinians come back into that area. And guess what else has started happening? Hamas has started to come back into that region in the northern part of Gaza. And he said a, a very interesting point. He said, you can't tell the difference between a civilian on the street and Hamas because they look alike. And the Palestinians are supporting Hamas. So we have to be very careful of that. But if the United States would stand up and say Israel is not just an ally, but Israel is our friend, Brother Swaggart, I believe and I know for a fact the rest of the world would look at that and pay close attention. Israel is in existence right now because of that wonderful UN vote that took place in 1947 that created Israel as the state of Israel as a nation. We need our leadership to wake up and to do what's right. But Brother Swaggart, one last point on this. We can point fingers... But at the end of the day, because of how our government and our nation is formed, we the people have some accountability. We the people are being given an opportunity in 2024, this year, to make the right changes. To make changes so that we have leadership that will do what is right and to stand with Israel. Well, also, we should make it a, a system of prayer every day. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and uh, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will heal their land, I will forgive their sin. And um, we can do something, but the question I want to ask, is there coming an hour when the USA will not stand with Israel? Well, I, I believe if, if we want to look eschatologically into the future, I personally don't believe that the United States will be in much of a position at the time of the Antichrist to stand with Israel. And I believe everything happening now is moving in that direction. The world, just as the church is being prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the rapture, the world is being prepared for the coming of the Antichrist. Yeah, the, That's the, what's happening. The question is, you know, the Antichrist will defeat Israel, be the second time Israel will be defeated, and um, will... Uh, the USA step in and help, but it's no, it's no record that she will. I, I don't see how, so, you know, you don't want to get into guesswork here, but let, let's just use logic for a moment. When you have millions upon millions of believers that are, in, a, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they're gone. This country is going to fall into some major chaos. Right. And, and let me say this right. as a caveat. A lot of Christians are running around distracted, fearful, scared that our U.S. dollar is going to collapse please, if you're listening, don't, don't worry about that. That day is coming, though, because after the rapture of the church, everything's going to fall apart. And I believe that everything is going to be, have to be redrawn, if you can use that well, terminology. They're, they're taking all the light out of the, the, the world. And as a result, our entire economy will collapse, our government will collapse, everything will have to change. Again, you've got millions of people that are going to be missing in just a moment. They can keep my 50 cents at that point. I don't but care. But that's when the rapture takes place. That's after the rapture. But I believe that, I, I really believe this, until the rapture, from now until the time of the rapture, I believe that God is going to preserve the United States, not because of Wall Street, because of Main Street, or because of Hollywood, or anything like that, but because the United States of America still has believers that are preaching and proclaiming the gospel right. and that are interceding. Yes. If the Lord spares our nation, it's because of the church. And I believe God's going to do it because he's promised there's going to be a tremendous harvest. And everyone yes, listening is. Right, right now is a part of that. Right. There's going to be a harvest of souls. But, Brother Swagger, the fact is, the United States, to, to, to again answer your question, what we are seeing is the United States and our leadership is moving further and further in a direction that does not truly support Israel. It's waning. Now, that can be quickly salvaged, but you made a great point. It doesn't start in Washington. It starts with the church praying and seeking God. That's right. where it begins. Yeah. Okay, Donnie, I'm sorry. 
thought somebody said something. Fourth verse, please. And I will turn you back and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you forth. And all of your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. This prophecy refers to the Battle of Armageddon, which will be the second invasion by the Antichrist of Israel, in which he will be totally destroyed. The first invasion will take place in the midst of the Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist will then show his true colors. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all of his bands, the house of Tamara and of the north quarters, and all of his bands, and many people with you. These passages merely reinforce the statements previously made that the army of the Antichrist will consist of people from many countries, including Russia. Be you prepared, and prepare for yourself, you and all of your company who are assembled unto you, and be you a guard unto them. Be thou prepared merely refers to a taunt given by the Holy Spirit to the Antichrist. In other words... Prepare yourself to the very best of your ability, and still it will avail you nothing, as you will be totally defeated. The Antichrist has faced, he will face mighty armies, the powerful army of Israel, but he's never faced God before. And he will face the Lord, and uh, it will be a catastrophe for him. Because you're talking about power such as the world has never seen before when you talk about the second coming of the Lord. Um, It's it's power like we cannot even begin to imagine. And um, uh, that's when the Antichrist will be defeated. All of his cohorts will be defeated. His army will be defeated. Two-thirds of it will be slaughtered. And uh, what righteous men have wanted the Lord to do for centuries, the Lord will do at that time. And uh, uh, read that seventh verse again, if you will, Donnie. I mean, uh, yes. Be you prepared and prepare for yourself, you and all of your company who are assembled unto you. And be you a guard unto them. Go ahead, Gabriel. Be thou prepared merely refers to a taunt given by the Holy Spirit to the Antichrist. In other words, prepare yourself to the very best of your ability, and still it will avail you nothing, as you will be totally defeated. Speaking of the Antichrist, do you all think that he is alive today? He could be. Right. Because by the time he takes over... He will have already established himself as a world leader. Right. So they could be doing the foundational work for that even today. He won't be revealed until after the church. Right. And you ask, will there be a time that the United States does not support Israel? Yes. After the rapture, when all of the Christians are taken out, it's the Christians right now that keep the United States in support of Israel. True. Once we are gone and evil and wickedness have taken over, then we see masses of people today that want to turn their backs on Israel. Many, even in Congress, who want to pull all of the funding and quit supporting Israel. Once Christians are taken out, there's nothing to prevent them. Right, but um, that's right down the road. Mm-hmm. And um, it's working that way very rapidly. Yes, right, right. Okay, go ahead, Don, if you will, please. After many days you shall be visited. In the latter years you shall, you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste. 
but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. The two phrases, after many days and in the latter years, refer to the present time and the immediate future. Therefore, any claims that this chapter has already been fulfilled are spurious. The land that is brought back from the sword refers to the many conflicts Israel has had since becoming a nation in 1948. And is gathered out of many people refers to the various nations, such as Egypt, Syria, Iraq, etc., which did not desire Israel to become a nation, and which therefore greatly opposed her. But it is brought forth out of the nation pertains to the United Nations voting that Israel would become a state, with even Russia voting her approval. And they shall dwell safely, all of them refers to the terrible horror of the Holocaust in World War II, with some six million Jews being slaughtered by Hitler, and Israel then demanding a homeland instead of being scattered all over the world. Their feeling was that if that, this could be obtained, then they would be safe. Do you all think that, that our support of Israel is political, or do some of our lawmakers, do they understand the spiritual implications of this little country? Does the church understand the spiritual implications of well, this country called Israel? I think a lot of your politicians that call themselves conservatives, they may not understand anything spiritually about it, but they recognize that this is the only ally that we have in a very volatile part of the world, the seat of all terrorism. So you're thinking their reasoning is, is political? Yes. Now, there, 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 there are some. I think that our, our Speaker of the House is a very strong Baptist. He may have some spiritual inkling, and, and there are some that, there's always some that might, but I think the vast majority of them, it would be political. I think in the uh, early days, of, or in the early 1900s through the 1920s and 30s and in the 40s, I think there was more of a spiritual influence in the support of Israel in our politics, but I think that over the years, people may have lost sight of why we did support Israel. I, I like last week, I talked a little bit about the rise of dispensationalism and how dif dispensationalism affected American and influenced American politics. I do believe... Excuse uh, me, does it influence our support of Israel? It, it did originally. I'm not certain it did it does today i think today is more political than spiritual but i feel like early on there were uh politicians who were influenced by scripture and their support of israel and i think that whenever the dispensationalists came along and said that the church had not replaced israel and then we see prophecy being fulfilled and we see the nation of israel forming i think that a lot of people were wise to that this was what was, what was playing out was in Scripture, but officially America supported Israel because it was the only democracy in the Middle East. Was well, the, it, that was, but that's later on. Israel didn't become a country until 1948. Yeah. But prior to that, there was no nation of Israel. Yeah. So I, there was no really spiritual inkling or, or, or idea among our political leaders. Matter of fact, we had the opportunity in the early days of World War II to rescue thousands of Jews. Yeah. And Roosevelt turned them away. They were in the boats, they were at our docks, and we would not let them land. And we literally, by the order of the president, sent them back and they died in the Holocaust. And so Israel was, it was no Israel, it was Palestine, controlled by the British, uh, and influenced by the British. but. It was only after Israel became a state and strong prophecy teaching. That's when in the night, late 40s and the early 50s, two things began to happen in the church, the divine healing movement. And out of that divine healing movement came a lot of Bible prophecy teachers 
And that's when the church began to be educated on what the Bible has to say about Israel. So that would have been the late 50s on up to today. I mean, that's true, but in the, in the 20s and 30s, people like Schofield, they were beginning to teach that it, had to, it had, wasn't fulfilled yet, but that mm-hmm. there would be a coming back in and in a formation of the nation of Israel. So I'm just the early groundwork of dispensationalism, then we see Israel as a, become a nation in 1948. But, I, you know, af, after that point, just like you said, yes, a lot of Bible prophecy teachers began to stress it, but I think that the genesis of that goes back further to the beginnings of the dispensational movement because uh, if you look in all of the commentaries in the 1800s, all of them are, are having the church replacing Israel except for one, the Methodist pulpit commentary is the only commentary I've ever found that believed that there must be a future formation of a nation of Israel. That's the only one I've ever seen. So I, I think the I mean, you're right, it didn't happen until 1948, but I think some of the groundwork was laid in the early 1900s before. And, and then, it, so I do believe that that influenced some of our political leaders originally. I don't think that that's the main influence now as far as the support of Israel, but I do believe that it did. And I, I think that the rise of these prophecy teachers in the 50s and the 60s has influenced some political leaders too. Is there any leadership in Israel that is aware of what the Bible says about their future? Well, yes. I mean, they, I'll say that to yes to a certain degree. Uh, in, in Israel, you've got, so you've got a very interesting demographic as far as the government's concerned. You have many different parties that comprise many different beliefs, even within Judaism. You have very secular Jews in Israel in leadership, and you have those that are very orthodox. So, Brother Swaggart, I think that the target point of your question would be those that would understand and consider what the scriptures have to say. And to understand the heart, the heartbeat of the Jewish people, when diaspora, diaspora, however you pronounce it, but when, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, and the Jews were scattered all over the world, and that would last for some 2,000 years, no matter where the Jew was in the world, they would assimilate into the culture, but they maintained their thought of next year Jerusalem. Right, yeah. It was always in the heart of the Jewish people to return to the land, the land of Israel. That is still in the heart of the Jews, and they, they, they're in Israel, but they desire peace, they desire security. And I think what what shines brighter than anything else is that, even for those that are secular in in, in Israel and leadership and those that are very familiar with the Scriptures, they're looking to be recognized. And this is why they will accept the Antichrist. He will prosper through craft, through deceit. He will confirm a covenant. And what that covenant will do is offer... Israel a recognition and a, a security, not, not a cessation of hostility as much like peace being shalom, but a peace that will give them recognition. They're so desperate, that's not the right word, they desire so much to be recognized that even the first inkling that someone's willing to do that, Brother Swaggart, they will immediately give up as much as necessary and make concessions. So the leadership in Israel, they understand their future as far as their past is concerned in the Word of God, really in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, but they don't really believe the New Testament. Right. So the no, teachings in the book of Revelation, all of what's in Revelation, you can find it in, in the Old Testament. It's all there. But understanding it relative to the Lord Jesus Christ, no. They don't understand that. Right. So therefore, yeah. they don't understand what's going to come. And what is so heartbreaking to realize is what the Bible tells us. There's darker days ahead for Israel, national Israel, than even what's behind. Right. The Holocaust, right. awful. I mean, two-thirds of my grandfather's family were killed in the Holocaust in, in Auschwitz. They were taken there. They were killed. And of the six million-plus Jews that were slaughtered, that's what Holocaust is. It was Shoah. It was a slaughtering. 
there is yet a worse day ahead. If they believe that and recognize that to the degree that the Bible teaches it, they would right now accept Jesus Christ but it's, as their Messiah. But sadly, it's going to take them getting to the point of almost utter destruction. And then as he returns, they will look to him. And, and, and they will ask him the question, where did you receive the wounds in your hands, in your side? And he will tell them, I received them in the house of my friends, talking about that they crucified him. So, Brother Swagger, no, they, they're not operating in faith because true faith will ultimately look to the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the time that you have just said, every Jew in the world, the implications are that every Jew in the world is going to accept Christ They'll as their saved. Savior and their Lord. Be saved. Yes. I, I, I was reading the other day behind Benjamin Netanyahu. They asked him, did he ever take off? He said, yes, on Saturdays. And... Um, what do you do? They asked him. He said, well, I spend a lot of time reading the Bible, but I'm sure it's the Old Testament, but I don't know. Bible. Yeah. They said, and, and they do. I mean, when you talk about the Torah, the Tanakh, I mean, that's, that's the Old Testament as we call it. But they, they, know, they know the scriptures. They know their history. They know it. But what the, the missing piece, the linchpin of it all is Jesus Christ. And if you don't have Christ then you're missing so much. And, and everything in the Old Testament that points to the right, promise of Christ, right, right. that's what's missing. That's why when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, foremost on my heart and my mind is, Lord, that the gospel may go into Jerusalem, may, may go into Israel, Jerusalem, Gaza, West Bank, the whole thing, so that every Jew, every Palestinian, every Arab, everyone, whosoever will, can hear and take over the water of life. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu is being pressured strongly right now. I read an article today that they look like they're coming to an agreement as far as... Um, um, they like a ceasefire? Ceasefire. Well, no, they, they... The Prime Minister is... You're right, he's getting squeezed on every angle because he's trying to appease the world. He's trying to balance his relationship with the United States and he's trying to do what's right for his country and for his people. Hamas wants this, the United States wants that, but so far, I must say, I'm, I would not want to be in that man's shoes right. because he has stood firm. And thus far, it seems that they understand they've got to finish the task that they started. I just pray that they're not pressured into making yet another concession that would make all of this bloodshed, this hostility, this conflict... I don't want to say a waste, but at the end of the day, it's what it would end up being. But it sort of read like that they were considering it. Well, I think Israel's willing to consider at first discussion just about anything. But when you start to look into the details of it, they're not that far to the point where they'll just accept absolutely anything. And what Hamas proposed was, was absolutely absurd. But the Lord loves these people. Oh, he's, they're still the apple of his eye. They are his people. That doesn't mean they're saved. They die without accepting Jesus Christ. They die lost. There is no second type of salvation for Jews other than the church. And, um, but still, God made promises to them, and he keeps his promises. Oh, yes, he does. And uh, if, if you care to be honest about it, you, you have to agree that something is behind this situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have watched Israel attacked from every quarter. Mm -hmm. Some of uh, the nations in the, in the Middle East, and instead of coming out weaker, they've come out stronger. That's right. Israel has. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, you have to admit it, something's going on here. These people couldn't have survived. And I remember standing on Masada, in Israel, and um, you could look down and see the ruins of where the Romans uh, took that place 2,000 years ago. I asked the guide, I said, do you realize that Rome today, her Caesars are peanut grinders, and uh, she's, she's a uh, Mighty Rome is no more. That's right. 
But Israel is one of the most powerful nations in the world. You know, he stood there, at, despite its small size, he stood there, said nothing. And finally he said, you know, I've never thought of that. And uh, that's God. That's God, yes. That's God. But like you said a moment ago, their darkest days are done, he said. Their darkest days are ahead. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, they're going to have to fight the Antichrist. That's right. Yeah. Well, Brother Swaggart, I'll say this. I've, I've been to the exact spot that you're talking about. And I, was, I remember thinking that. It was a nice hot day there on top of Masada, too. But I remember looking down and seeing all that and thinking of this, that the Lord promised he would see his people through, that they would not be destroyed. He is the holy and the faithful one of Israel. And I, I want to make it personal for just a moment, not to get too far off the point, but if God can preserve these people through all that they've endured over the last 2,000 plus years, and he's been able to keep his promises to them, what he's promised us, it will come to pass. Right. God is able right. to do it. If he can keep his people... And the promises to them, he can keep and fulfill every promise to us personally and individually. God is able. He is able to do it. Yes, my Lord is able. He's able. Well, I know that he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. My Lord is able. He's able. I know that he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through, for he has healed the broken hearted, made the blind to see, healed the sick, raised the dead. See you Sunday morning, the Lord willing. you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call one 800 288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.